You're very nice to say. We're off and running. The session has begun. Yes, it has. And uh, yesterday, the governor did his State of the State address, concluded about 8.30 last night. And in it was the major announcement he had hinted he would make, which uh, many of us suspected would be a 50% reduction in the personal income tax. Uh, Steve, your reaction as you heard that? You know, um, the West Virginia Chamber of Commerce has long said that it's very important to have a competitive tax system. We have to have enough money to provide basic services. People want the police to be there when they need to call the police. They want the schools to be uh, there for their children and to be of high quality. Uh, so we have to have enough gov- money for, uh, into government to do those things. But we also have to be aware that we live in a world where it's very competitive and others may have lower tax rates that attract people into their state. So this is a balancing act uh, that the governor and the legislature will be working on uh, as to which policies are likely to uh, both fund government adequately, and right now we've got an enormous surplus. We really are over-collecting. Um, but we also have to be aware that economies are cyclical, uh, and uh, the severance tax, which is kicking in so much extra money, um, will not, uh, in all probability, will not always throw in the amount of money that it's throwing in. And if we have an economic downturn, sales tax collections will go down and income tax tax collections will go down. But we are on the page of being competitive, always looking at what uh, our neighbors are doing. Our personal income tax rates are higher than in most of the surrounding states. And um, so we think it's a very good thing to be looking at reducing these taxes. Uh, We just are on the page of let's be careful, let's be smart about how we do this, and um, But putting more money into the pockets of working uh, West Virginians and retirees we have living in West Virginia, all of our West Virginia families, stimulates the economy because most of that money finds its way back into um, the economy by being spent. Um, so um, uh, we, we think that uh, while we want to – certainly we want to see the details of the proposal, we're encouraged that we are in a position to be able to talk about – reducing taxes and not having to raise them. I've certainly been around long enough to remember when we had to talk about raising tax. Now we're in a position to be able to talk about reducing tax. And frankly, I'd rather be in the position of talking about reducing tax than raising tax. Steve, Eric Householder, over the last couple of years, when he was finance chairman, he's now the House Majority Leader, but uh, he had introduced something similar to what the governor was proposing last night, I think perhaps on a bit more of a measured scale, and he included triggers in there so that the state would then not go to the next level of deduction or reduction if the economic situation had changed. And the governor's calling for this 50% to be phased in over three years, 30% the first year, then 10%, then the next 10%. Do you believe that that is the ideal way to do it and that is that is uh, sort of the way this will come out at the end well and excuse me for taking a little coughing uh, second there so um when uh, a delegate householder was chairman of the finance committee we worked uh, closely with him we have a high regard for uh his role as chairman uh, of the finance committee of course as you point out that uh, role has changed now uh, we liked his plan. We talked with him um, at the time. Uh, Brian Dayton, who you've had on your show, spent uh, a fair amount of time uh, talking with then Finance Committee Chairman Householder about that plan. We thought his plan had a great deal of merit. We thought it was well thought through. We liked the idea that it had the um, ability to put some brakes on if brakes needed to be put on, but it also recognized the importance of being competitive and getting some money back into the pockets of uh, West Virginians. Um, so we like that plan. We think the legislature, um, when, the, when we actually see what the governor submits, and we're hoping to get to see that soon. Last year, it was several weeks into the session before we saw uh, the governor's bills. Um, so we're we're eager to see. For for instance, you could ask yourself, well, if we're let's say you do like this plan, 
which brackets will be cut and when. Uh, that, that's just a straight up question. It's, I'm not saying that to be rhetorical or argumentative. It's just a piece of information that anybody who's trying to make a good decision would need to have. Um, in other words, uh, is, is, we didn't get the answer last night. Is this, uh, are all brackets to be cut by 30% or are some brackets to be cut more than others? I suspect that question will be asked very early on in this process. Um, I think a lot of people are favorable to the idea of reducing. Remember, our personal income tax rate at the highest rate is 6.5%, and that 6.5% kicks in uh, at a low enough number that many, many of our working families in West Virginia pay the highest rate, and they are not paying rates that high in the surrounding states. So, uh, we are not criticizing the proposal. We simply want to know more about it, and we want to see how it would work, and we want to be uh, – and we would do that in the context of – and let's all remember, um, we've got to uh, pay the public employees more. We're losing public employees very quickly. Nobody really likes talking about that, but the fact is we are having trouble. We have uh, – thousands of open positions within state government. We've got a real hole in the bucket when it comes to the public employees um, insurance program, and I mean a real hole in the bucket. Um, And we have, uh, as has been well documented, we have a real problem in having enough uh, social workers and child services workers and so forth to deal with the huge problems that the drug crisis has brought on, among other problems. But exacerbated hugely by the drug problem. So it's a complex problem that needs to be solved, and we are all for solving it, and to the extent that we can all work together to do it, and I'm making a little bit of an editorial comment on this point, to the extent we can all work together to do it, we'll be better off. John Gilstrap. Do you see a way that this personal income tax uh, decrease doesn't happen? It just I don't, I don't know. Who's going to push back on it? Uh uh, John, good to be with you. Yes, I do see a way, and that would simply be if the uh, legislative bodies can't agree. And that is what has happened in the last several years related to the income tax uh, reduction proposals. Um, it, it, this is, it, I almost, it, this is trite to say, but it happens to be true. The devil's in the details. And until we know the details, now I'm going to back up a second and say, You know, we at the West Virginia Chamber have long been proponents of pre-filing of bills. We simply think some of these issues are complex enough that we need to get a look at them uh, early on. We don't, we, we, you know, we do things in this very rushed, oh, I'm going to keep my ideas a secret and I'm not going to talk to people about them. And then, boom, here it is. And and then we have to go back and do uh, serious analysis of what the um, ramifications are. So, um, but on the whole, um, we think there's, there is an opportunity to reduce tax. We know that reducing tax always stimulates the economy because more money flows into the economy. And, uh, uh, we want to work with, uh, the legislators and the governor to try to come up with the best solution. So to your knowledge, is, is the focus of the income tax cut? targeted at the at individual families so that individual families will see it ultimately a 50 percent reduction or is it targeted at a 50 percent cut in the revenue that is derived from income tax you know, well for example if you eliminate all of the yeah. lower brackets and just keep 6.5 you I, I, I don't have know the math but somewhere there there's, yeah. a, there's a balance I think your analogy is largely correct, and that's where we are sort of saying we really need to see what the proposal is. I mean, if we if we were to to do what um, you just you know, I know this is not your proposal, but let's just say it turned out that way that we eliminated all of the lower brackets and kept the higher brackets. Seventy per, approximately seventy percent of the personal income tax collected in West Virginia is collected from those people who are paying at the highest rate. Um, So um, uh, you you would not be giving um, a tax cut to the people um, at the 
uh, you wouldn't be giving as big a tax cut to the people at the lower rate if we did it that way. But that's why we want to see we, we re- the, the, the proposal, how you do it, is very important. Yeah, I can see that. And frankly, we think people at the lowest ends of the income spectrum, uh, candidly, those are the people who need the biggest break. They, they are having a tough time in life. Inflation has been tough on them. And um, if you're not earning very much, uh, you just have, obviously, you have less capacity to pay than for those who are earning the most. Steve Roberts is our guest, president of the West Virginia Chamber of Commerce. John, did you have a follow-up question for Steve? No, I was just saying, so then, <clears throat> kind of tracking this out of my head, this becomes sort of regional then, because, uh, as I understand it, there there are pockets of concentrated wealth in West Virginia that are mostly in the eastern and northern panhandle. And then kind of as you get to other parts within in the state, the poverty rates get much higher. So I'm, I'm just projecting this out where the negotiation has to happen to to uh, for everybody to feel that they've, they've been treated equitably. Right. You, you know, it's interesting. You can track wealth in West Virginia by census tract and by zip code. And there's, there simply are um, a small handful of census tracts and a small handful of zip codes. Um, some of those are found in Morgantown, Charleston uh, in particular, and in the eastern panhandle, um, where uh, there, is, um, there is actually substantial wealth. Um, but on the whole, West Virginia is 50th in the nation in millionaires per capita. The, the wealth in West Virginia is not widespread. And we've unfortunately over the years created a good many incentives for people who do have wealth to take it somewhere else. Mm-hmm. I was involved in a conversation earlier this morning that included uh, tax lawyers and, and, um, and uh, CPAs who are practitioners in this area who have talked about the large outflow of capital to uh, chiefly to Florida uh, from elderly people. Steve, some have concerns regarding any major tax cut policy that's introduced, especially one as large as 50 percent, that the surpluses are built on fool's gold, so to speak, citing an increase in uh, severance taxes, for instance, once fuel prices recede. That could go away. I checked the December numbers as provided to me by Senate President Craig Blair. December, we had a $145 million surplus. 43% of that was severance, which uh, was $63 million over estimates. So that's 43% of $145 million. And then uh, just a bit more than that was made up of the personal income tax, the sales tax, and the corporate net combined which combined equaled $67 million. And again, the severance was was 63. And the explanation for some of that growth was also credited to inflation. The more things cost, the more you pay in sales tax. Uh, The more people have to spend to buy something, the more a corporation makes a profit. Therefore, their corporate net will be higher and so on and so on. So do you see the logic there and, and do you buy it? Do you agree with it? Rob, I th- actually, I think you're exactly right, and I think you've uh, outlined the situation very well. This is why we think we have to be careful. Do we want to put more money into the pockets of West Virginia people? Yes. Do we think um, we, this will be, I believe, the third year in a row that we have will have um, run very substantial surpluses? But of course, economies, as you point out, economies are cyclical. And, uh, you know, to say the obvious, what goes up often comes down. Um, and gas prices, uh, gas, you know, we, we're seeing this in, in our everyday lives. Gasoline prices were up and then they came down. Uh, on the other hand, most people recognize that when they go to their grocery store, food prices still seem pretty stiff. So, um, we, um, I, I want to put on the table the idea that we've, um, while we've got, uh, on the whole, we look pretty competitive on our business taxes, we do have some places where we stand out, um, and, and in not a good way. We have, um, for the most part, we have the highest severance taxes in the country. And so if we were talking about lowering some rates, 
you know, let's just remember that the people who are paying severance tax are paying at one of, if not the highest, one of the highest rates in the country, number one. Number two, our corporate net income tax is higher than in any surrounding state. Now, I will tell you, corporations believe strongly that they want to do their fair share. They want to pay their part of the freight. But let's, in the spirit of being competitive, let's remember that there are lots of states around us that have a lower corporate net income tax rate than West Virginia. And then let me, and you're not going to be surprised that I go here because we've talked about this before, we're the only state that collects the tangible personal property tax on business equipment and, and inventory um, in the way that we do. Uh, there are a few other states that have that tax, but they either have it at a much, much lower rate or they have substantial uh, credits and deductions related to it. So we have some things that um, we have some splinters um, that we need to be aware of. And I would say uh, from a chamber of commerce and building the economy point of view, if we make ourselves attractive to business and we attract uh, good-paying jobs, a lot of problems that we have will suddenly go away. If we could get people's incomes uh, who are not in these zip codes that we made reference to earlier, if we could get their incomes up, uh, they would have a lot more disposable income, and their lives would get a lot better. John. The governor talked last night about during the height of COVID having 2,000 uh, hospital beds that had to remain unstaffed because of, of lack of nursing and, and uh, presumably medical care in general. A problem with EMS, you know, these are very important issues f- for attracting people into a state. They want to make sure that they're going to be treated well when they're sick and that their kids are going to get the good education and, and all of that. Um, in the last couple of weeks, we have the issues of PEIA. Where is, it, is Wheeling? Is that the hospital that? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, and yesterday, President Blair uh, proposed a, or I think the Senate passed a bill that uh, where PEIA will reimburse hospitals at 110 percent of Medicare rates. Right. Where Medicare, does that money yeah. come from? Well, right now uh, we right now we have the money, and we have it in um, an account that is known as the surplus account. Uh, We're running um, uh, approximately, and this is a very rounded off number, but approximately an $850 million budget surplus through the first six months of the fiscal year. So we are on track to end this fiscal year with over 1.8, excuse me, (laughs) I better better redo my math, $1.6 billion um, in just surplus money, completely unallocated money. And much of the money that is in um, the proposal that we heard last night would come from that surplus. Let's, does that repair uh, the not, hole in the bucket, or does it just temporarily no, plug the hole in the bucket? It, 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 I'm not sure it even temporarily repairs the hole in the bucket. This bucket is so leaky, um, and that's because medical costs have gone up. And frankly, and I'm just going to, again, offer a sort of a personal commentary here. Look. If I'm sick, and particularly if I'm really sick, I'll pay money and pay more money if it helps me um, get well or have a better life. So most of us do not object to the fact that we've had fantastic advances in medical research, but all of that costs money. And what we've done in West Virginia is we've, we've not acknowledged that uh, the price of delivery has gone up, and in, within PEI, PEIA, PEIA recipients are actually paying less for their insurance than they were four years ago. And we have lots and lots of people on that insurance in West Virginia. It's a big, big program. So when the hospitals, the, the rest of us who are not on PEIA um, are helping, first of all, we're helping to to uh, pay that price through the cost shift, our insurance costs more because those who are on PEIA are paying less, number one. And number two, we're underpaying the providers, which leaves the hospitals in a very distressed place. We all want to go into the newest, cleanest hospital with the best and most up-to-date equipment, and and yet we, we short 
uh, the, the hospitals on that, and uh, we're and it's it, it, and we're at a breaking point. We're at the crisis point. It will only get worse from here if we don't seriously address the leaky bucket issue. Steve. And the leaky bu- bucket issue is quickly defined. I'll be very brief. Is quickly defined as we have too many people getting insurance for too little money. Steve, I appreciate your time this morning, as always, and I uh, hope to talk with you more as the session continues this year. It's always good to be with you. Thank you for having me on, and um, I'm, I'm available when you want to talk. Well, I appreciate that, sir. Have a great day, okay? Yes, sir. Best to you and your listeners, too.